Hi, everyone. Welcome to Between Two Speakers, where Randy Ford and I talk about speaking. I'm Mariana Swallow, and I'm a professional public speaking coach. You can find me at marianaswallow.com. And I'm also an instructor of business and professional speaking at Loyola University in Chicago. And I'm Randy Ford. I'm a writer and a storytelling strategist. You can find me at firststorystrategies.com. And Mary, it's been really fun doing Between Two Speakers, and I hope it goes on for a while. But one of the really cool things about it, besides getting to talk to you, is um, that we have people who are listening now and yes, watching. Yes, we do. And yes. we've even gotten um, some questions from some people. So today, we thought we could go through some a few of these questions, um, particularly ones that are are related to um, virtual meetings mm -hmm. and Zoom. And, and this is kind of a great follow-up to a, an episode we did where we had our friend Mike Alonji on mm -hmm. uh, talking about some video tips of the best way to look on Zoom. Yep. Um, so uh, we've got some questions here. Can I throw the first one out and get your thoughts on it? Yeah, please do. How do you show energy on Zoom if it's not your favorite meeting style or if it's your fifth meeting of the day? Yeah, that's a great question, Randy. And I've heard this from clients that I have, client, I'm sure you've heard it from some of your own clients. And the other thing I hear related to this is, you know, well, what if I'm more introverted? But this is the reality we're in. So my advice for that is to plan to do something to make sure that there is energy in yourself in the meeting. So frequent breaks. Um, if you're between meetings, step outside for a second, even if it's just a 30 second break. And another thing I like to do, and I've done this on some of our conference calls that you and I have had, is I'm usually sitting here at this table, but I will go to a tall desk or a built-in and put my computer and just stand for a meeting. Because when we stand, we naturally bring more energy. Our blood is flowing, we're not sitting down, we're not slumping. So any way you can mix it up, whether it's with frequent breaks, stepping outside for some air, or changing your actual seating position or standing position, that will naturally bring more energy and make it a little more um, energetic but engaging for yourself as a meeting participant. Absolutely. I think those are all great tips. And what I, what I would add is that, you know, sometimes it's, it's about energy, but also if you think about it as, as presence and being mm. kind of present. So you think about for those of us who, um, you know, may remember the days of being able to speak to a live audience and you, right. you often will have like space you can work with, not always, but you may be able to move around or, or something. Um, but in Zoom, your space is right here. And you, you have to pretty much be present. If you're in a meeting in a conference room and somebody asks a question, you know, it might make sense to do this and look away while you're thinking about it. But the message that it's kind of subtly sending on Zoom is that you're not there. You're over there. You're looking right. at something, you're, you're completely out of it. And this is the only room we have. So you have to kind of stay within this space. I love the idea of a standing desk because you're right, that does give you energy and you mm -hmm. do feel more um, inclined to look at the camera, um, which is something we talk about often. But I would, you know, caution, sometimes I see people who then like, maybe have had too much coffee or they're just naturally energetic mm -hmm. and standing gives them the opportunity to bounce around and they don't really realize they're doing it and it's almost like too much energy. Or for those of us who sit, the swivel is also a thing. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I've had people, when they deliver presentations, they stand and then they do this, they do the swaying thing. And obviously yeah. you can see my Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's one of those things that always happens. For years, it killed me on The Daily Show, to be honest, that they had swivel chairs uh, right. for their guests because no matter how professional or well-trained somebody was in media or being on TV, they had a tendency to swivel, um, right. even if it was like a friendly interview. I remember watching then President Obama swiveling in a chair on The Daily Show. Um, and who should have better training and presence than, than right. him? And I don't remember um, that one, but I, I want to see that now. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, and luckily, most people don't notice that. And the other thing I want to say about all of these is we're talking about like formal presentations or very high stakes meetings. We're mm -hmm. not talking about if you're getting together, you know, we saw your Christmas tree. If you're getting together at the holidays with your family, let your shoulders slump. Absolutely. Move around if you want. Like, that mm -hmm. doesn't matter. If, if you and I are on here just, like, chit-chatting, that is one thing. But we're talking about, like, if you really need to bring it for some reason. Right. 
Right. And one other tip I will add is if you don't want to stand or it's uncomfortable to stand, one thing that will naturally bring energy, I'm sitting in a stationary dining room chair. If you scoot your butt to the edge of your seat, that naturally raises your posture and that brings energy as well. That's a great tip. And I'm, uh, I, I'm going to start doing that. Um, the next question is, is kind of a, it builds on that. So how do you create energy and engagement when you are leading virtual meetings? What do you think? I think a huge part of this, Randy, is planning. So, uh, and some of these were mentioned, if you look back to the episode with Bernadette Smith, you know, we don't always just have to be Mayor Swallow, Randy Ford. Why not add something to your name as the leader of the meeting, ask people to change their Zoom names and add a little fact about themselves like vegetarian or Disney collector or part-time DJ, you know, tell something about yourself. You know, we used to have the name tense when we would go into meetings at work and, and write our name or the, you know, facilitator might say, oh, put your department on there or how long you've been with the company, but use the, the names on Zoom. They don't just have to be the names. Why not use it as a way to create engagement? So something like that, but then also planning to create engagement. And this does take some forethought and planning. My favorite way, we talked about this on the very first coffee break I did for you, is using icebreakers. And it doesn't have to be, um, you talked about some great best practices for icebreakers. It doesn't have to be something people have to think about a lot. But if you could travel anywhere today, where would it be? Um, you know, what's, some, what's one thing you miss the most during the pandemic? Um, what's your favorite ice cream flavor or favorite restaurant to go to for lunch if you all work in the same area? And just have everyone, you know, go around and if the room's new to each other, you know, share your name and then share your favorite ice cream flavor. Yeah. The one caveat I give for icebreakers is in case there is someone who doesn't, you know, have an answer for that, for instance, one of my favorite icebreakers is your very first concert. I've had clients who've never been to a concert before. Then I say, okay, tell me your, your favorite movie then. You give, give them an option if you need to. But mm-hmm. find a way to make that engagement, not just let's sit here and talk about the meeting stuff. Yeah, that's great. And one thing that I've seen um, some successful facilitators do, and I've tried to adopt this, mm-hmm. is um, letting, you know, calling on someone, asking them to answer that icebreaker question, as well as the, if, if it's a new group, you know, mm-hmm. the, the basics, this is who I am, this is what I do. And then that person picks the next person to go. I love that. Uh, which Passing. Is, yeah, which is kind of a um, an interesting thing that I never really had thought about, and I definitely wouldn't think about doing that in an in-person setting, uh, but it definitely works when you're looking around the Brady Bunch Hollywood Squares um, kind of format at the other faces and, and picking out who should go next. Yeah. Um, and I think going back to your point of planning, I think it's also letting the people in the meeting know. I think an agenda is more important than it is for an in-person meeting. People Absolutely. need to know how long are they going to be sitting here? what is what is going to be expected of them and at what point yeah i think those are all great tips and that will also because they know what's coming they'll be a little more on their toes a little more engaged a little more aware whereas i think you're right it's um maybe in a in-person meeting we could maybe get away with not having the agenda but for the zoom meetings absolutely have an agenda even if it's just two items even if it's just here's what we're talking about today yeah, I also always encourage people to use the chat function. I mean, the chat is can be so lively, and and if you open that chat box and there's nothing going on there, it mm-hmm. you can feel just the energy of the meeting drop because you feel like no one is engaged. Yeah, um, absolutely. The and chat I find is a great option. And as the facilitator, you should remind your participants if you don't want to call it out, put it in the chat box. Because people who are more introverted or maybe, you know, they're working at home with kids, they don't want to disturb people, the chat box is a great option and I find a great way to engage people who are a little more quiet or need to be quiet for whatever reason. Sure. So what else do we get? Yeah, (laughs) this this last question that we'll tackle um, on this episode is, it's a little trickier and I'm very eager to hear what you think. So how do you look for the nonverbal cues so you know when to speak without cutting someone off or avoid the dead silence. Yeah, this one's tricky because I have been on meetings with nine people, which you can see on one screen. I've also been in meetings with 56 or 60 people. And at that point, you've got those two screens and you're pressing that arrow to scroll. So it's kind of unrealistic to expect the facilitator or the participants for that matter to see all the nonverbal cues. 
So similar to what we've said with the other questions, this requires a little planning. And what I would recommend is whoever's leading the meeting, stipulate up top or stipulate when you go into an activity that this is how we're gonna get answers. But also, so you don't get the crickets, let people know you expect them to participate. Or, you know, I wanna hear one answer from everyone, or we're gonna take comments from everyone who wants to speak today. What, whatever it is, but let people know it's okay to speak. Um, invite them to speak however you want them to. If you'd rather they hold up the hand or use the raise hand function, say so. If you want them just to unmute and just start talking, say so. Um, or if you want them to place their questions or comments in the chat, say that. Um, two people that we know, uh, two pastors actually from Gilead Chicago, Vince Amlin and Rebecca Anderson, each one does this a little differently, but they will say before they want people to speak on the meeting, you know, unmute your mic and talk, or if you would please place this in the chat, I will then read them out. So, uh, you know, plan for how you want it to go and then communicate that to your audience. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're the facilitator or the leader of that, I, I always like to give a little extra time in there. So you'll say, I want you to, to unmute or wave me down or put it in chat. Yeah. This is what we're going to talk about. And then uh, because there's always that little bit of lag, whether people are typing or they're nervous to go first. Yes. Uh, so building in that little bit of time helps. Um, I think, you know, if, if one tricky thing is that some people, uh, and you kind of alluded to this, aren't comfortable having their video on, or maybe right. they don't have a camera, or they're just joining by phone for some reason, then mm -hmm. that gets into even trickier territory because you don't know when that person is is uh, has something that they want to contribute. And so that can be problems, you know? But, but we also, this problem also goes back to non-video conference calls. You know, right. you, you always had people cutting each other off and people, somebody would talk and then somebody else and then both talk and then say, no, you go, no, you, no, you go. And then they'll always say, well, I was just going to say uh, blah, blah, blah right. and, and make their point. And so it is one of those things that I don't think there's going to be like a solution for, um, sure. especially if it's just a, a meeting, uh, but it definitely helps if the facilitator is, planning for that and mm -hmm. knows what instructions they're going to give on when somebody um, should be ready to speak. Yeah, you gave a great example when you get the crosstalk because yes, that happens if someone's a non-video participant and sometimes it happens with video participants. I saw this with my Loyola students this year and there was a lot of, there you go. So what I recommend then, what I would do for my students is it's up to the facilitator or the leader of the meeting to say, okay, we're gonna hear from Randy first and then Mayor, I want your comments. So I would recommend that the facilitator be kind of the, the decider when there's two people talking and just say, you know, I want to hear from Susie first and Sam second or, yeah. You know. And that's great because you give Sam an opportunity to get unmuted and be ready to go mm -hmm. without that, that extra lag again that we were just talking about. So Sam knows that he's on deck and, and is ready to go. Yeah. Um, another thing I heard, I read about this actually a couple weeks ago, the New York times interviewed students to see how they were doing with an entire zoom semester. And, one of the questions they asked was, do you participate in class or not? And overwhelmingly, the students said no, because in order to participate, they'd have to you know, make that reach and unmute themselves. And the reporter said, so that's the difference is unmuting yourself? And they said, yes. So what I try to do is I encourage my class to leave themselves unmuted the entire time, and they're welcome to speak up any time. And if, they, if there is crosstalk, I then say, okay, this one goes first, that person goes second. Interesting. That's and and I'm glad to hear that that's worked out. It it it, uh, it I would say yes. It's mostly worked out. It's uh, you know college students aren't the most talkative bunch, uh, but I give them the chat option as we discussed, and that seems to um, work better with certain students. But all in all, we got through. We had a great semester, and uh, and they quoted you a lot. So my hat oh. is off to you. Yeah. No. No. It was it was fun to get the chance to to talk with them. So um, I love that. Great. Uh, all right. It was also fun to get to answer these questions. Wherever you're watching this right now, please leave a comment with any questions that you have, things you think we should tackle, or um, if you have suggestions on any of these topics that we did, wherever you're watching this right now, feel free to comment uh, because we would love to, to know what's on your mind. You can also use the contact button on MarianaSwallow.com and send us a note. Let us know what speaking questions you'd like to hear answered. Thanks everybody for joining us for another uh, Between Two Speakers. I'm Randy Ford. I'm Mariana Swallow. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.